Welcome to the show, everybody. We have with us again, returning guest, Robert W. Sullivan IV. This man, absolutely fascinating for show. We talked about his books, Symbolism in Cinema. Um, he's got three of those. One, two, and we're going to be talking a lot about cinema, Symbolism 3, which is the one he just wrote in May 18th, 2021. So this spring, a brand new book. We're going to talk about this one. Uh, I said he's historian, philosopher, Scottish Rite Mason. I mean, he CEO, lawyer. I mean, he's got the full resume. I mean, this is this is man. He's just, and not to mention, just love thing likes to watch movies, and that's what I love too. And so it's this is a fantastic thing. So everybody, sit back. Robert W. Sullivan the Fourth is next. Welcome to the Three Beards Podcast. Craig, along with Austin and Chris, passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century. Let me out. Chris is with us here. He's um, Austin's going to be with us here shortly. He's wrangling a bunch of kids in the background, so it's going to be a little noisy on his end. But at this time, let's welcome back Robert W. Sullivan to the show. How are you, sir? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me back on uh, Three Beards. Like we were saying before the show, I can't believe three months have gone by, but there it I is. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to this evening's show. Yeah, we... We had, I mean, it's just we ran out of time last time, maybe just because it was just as with anything, it's just it's amazing when you get into this one, and then especially like with Symbolism Three um, book, book that you just released, and I apologize, I was going to bring get that ready here so I can show a picture for everybody, and I got that right now, and as so everybody can see up here on the screen, this is the book we're talking about right here. This one, there we go, quick. Click and stuff. So yeah, you can go right now. Kindle edition, um, re really six dollars for the Kindle edition. Have it delivered right now. You can be look looking at it as we're as we are talking. Uh, but this fa fantastic stuff. Or just the things that you brought. And what one of the questions I can't remember if I got to it in the first show, but I definitely wanted to ask this: What was the biggest thing that led you to starting this series? Oh right, no, that's a fair question. Um, it started with my first book, which was called The Royal Arch of Enoch, which was this, it's, which is this 600, 700 page book I wrote about esoteric Freemasonry, the founding of the country, how a lot of the symbolism was coming out of this one particular degree called The Royal Arch of Enoch, and it presented a historical anomaly as well. And uh, this book, um, you know, deals with a lot of very arcane, mystical philosophies, the mystery religions, Freemasonry philosophy. Um, you know, the symbolism of the rituals, things like that. And uh, when I was finishing the Royal Arch of Enoch, I wanted to sort of bring it up to modernity. And the final chapter of that dealt with Masonic themes and symbolism in film. Um, so some of the movies I touched upon was like the, na the first National Treasure movie, which is the Royal Arch of Enoch ritual um, on film. I got into some of the things, uh, symbolism with being there with Peter Sellers. Um, some of the other movies, uh, the Ninth Gate with Johnny Depp, that's interesting. <laughs> And I, that was the last chapter of the Royal Arch of Enoch, um, was talking about this Masonic sort of secret society symbolism in film. And this was something that always kind of interested me. And, 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 and this was 2012. And, and at that point, you could start kind of seeing it in other movies that the symbolism may not have been Masonic per se, but you were dealing with themes like related to Gnosticism or alchemy. And 
you mm -hmm. know, Easter eggs and things like that. And and I I, I wanted to continue this. So um, off of that last chapter of Royal Arch of Enoch, I put out my first book, which was in 20, which was the first movie book, which was in 2014 called Cinema Symbolism. And uh, again, the, the idea was I put that out and I talked about a slate of movies, but of course, books have to have a start and an alpha and omega. They have to have a start and a finish. So uh, there was still more movies I wanted to talk about. So I did Cinema Symbolism 2. And then, of course, I just released uh, back in the spring Cinema Symbolism 3. So that that's where they came out of. Yeah, and that's in real, really fascinating. I mean, it's just it's one of those things I've always my personal favorite. And that's why I kind of liked this one is, you know, a cult in Hollywood. I absolutely love, you know, even though as cheesy as they can be, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, just when you have everything that has to do with the devil, you know, anything that has to do with the occult and like stuff, I absolutely love those movies. And I just, I watched them. All. Like I said, one, it didn't get a whole lot of great reviews. The Ninth Gate with Johnny Depp. Love that movie. Oh, yeah. Um, well, that that's that that's one that I analyzed in um, the first book, in the Royal Arch of Enoch book. And that was one that I touched on again in the second cinema book. So I wanted to revisit it. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, I mean, you, you the, the whole idea of the nine gates to the kingdom of shadows. I mean, this runs parallel with, you know, what, what you know. This, I mean, this is this is uh, textbook mysticism, textbook Gnosticism. I mean, you the, the whole idea of the nine gates to the kingdom of shadows runs parallel with the nine, the seven spheres of the Hermetica, uh, the the Kabbalistic Sephirah. Um, the celestial hierarchies of pseudo Dionysius, Dionysius, these levels of spiritual purification um, that the soul has to pass through to receive some sort of, you know, supreme, you know, divine enlightenment of some kind. Of course, in the in the book um, and in the movie, I mean, they, they take this thing, they make it diabolical um, where it's these nine gates that, you know, sort of brings you into contact with with this sort of mm -hmm. demonic figure that is more akin to Lucifer than really with a Christianized version of Satan, um, you know, seems to be like a, a light bearer of some kind. Um, well, what, one of the things that one of the things that I always found um, interesting in that movie is the, the, the Lucifer characters played by this very beautiful woman. Um, I forget what her name is, Emmanuel something or another. I can't remember. Her oh, name. yeah, um, I, can, I can get that real quick. Yeah, no, it's OK. It, it, and 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 if 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 you know anything about astrology or astronomy you'll, or and mythology, you will know that Lucifer associates with the planet Venus. So it's one and the same thing. Um, and of course, Venus is the beauty goddess, Aphrodite in Greek mythology, Venus in the Roman mythology. And of course, the woman in the, the ninth gate, who is Lucifer, is, of course, very beautiful. And uh, one of the things that they draw upon, I, I thought was very interesting, is the Botticelli painting um, of Venus emerging from the seashell. Um, you know, this very beautiful neo, you know, Neoplatonic imagery mm -hmm. demonstrating Venus as divine love. And if you watch the Ninth Gate movie, um, all, all the uh, gas stations they stop at with uh, this beautiful woman are shell gas stations. Um, and that is completely designed to conjure the Botticelli painting of uh, Venus, you know, as Lucifer, as it were. I think I thought that was very that's interesting. A, that's an awesome take on it. I, I didn't even really think about that part. There's Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, there's, it's, that's it, who it, he's talking about. Yep. Yeah, it's very, it's very, um, the, the one thing that, you know, the one thing that these filmmakers will go to great lengths to is to conceal this stuff. And you really do have to have sort of uh, an esoteric eye for it. Um, it's years of research. Um, you know, you have to have comparative religion, you know, comparative mythology, paganism, Christianity, because there's a tremendous overlap with this stuff. Um, but no, uh, the, the Ninth Gate is, is a, tr I, I like the movie anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it's it's overloaded. I mean, we could do a probably a two hour show just on that alone. I mean, the the whole idea of the ninth gate again. We're you know, I mean, I'll just fast forward a little bit here. I mean, we're drawing on Dante Alighieri, the nine levels of hell. Um, if you watch the movie, you'll see little busts of Dante popping up here and there. Um, so, and then of course you want to get into the Masonic imagery of this. Um, you know, it, it, you get past the ninth gate, you receive the supreme enlightenment in the Royal Arch of Enoch degree. The, the name of the Godhead is concealed under nine arches. Um, so this whole idea of number nine as a repetitive trope that reveals some sort of, uh, secret, you know, divine, um, 
godhead wisdom whatever you want to call it um turns up in a lot of mythology it turns up in freemasonry and again you'll see parallels with this with the kabbalah with the sephirot um with the uh, pseudo pseudo dionysius with the celestial hierarchies and of course um with the hermetic spheres from uh, the hermetica um this is the dialogues with hermes trismegistus with the heart the seven spheres of course represent the seven uh planets the, these levels of spiritual pur purification the soul has to ascend through to receive the godhead um that's what this whole the whole nine gates are um mm -hmm. representing so so with all your expertise i've i've do i've tossed around the idea of when they throw so much masonry in it whether it's the royal art where it's whether it's different masonic degrees why do you think they include this in the films? I mean, I can't understand. I was watching a cartoon with my kid several months ago, and this old lady was in a rocking chair. It had the, the compass and square minus the G. And I'm like, okay, it's on the back of the rocking chair. Why do you think they equate all these symbolisms into the movies? Is it for people to catch that can catch it? Or what is your theory on that? Well, it depends. It, it, there's no one answer to it. Um, it depends on the context of how it's presented. Um, sometimes it could be there. I mean, sometimes in truth, it could be there inadvertently. Um, I mean, sometimes in a movie, you'll just be seeing a town setting and you'll see a Masonic, you know, building, you know, a lodge in the background it has no meaning. It's just a Masonic lodge or the rotary or something like that. Um, the one thing that my research really stresses is you there, there's no one answer to this. Um, there's no universal answer, and especially with symbolism. And if you've done any, if if the listener to this show has done any sort of research into this, you will know that when it comes to symbolism, there are multiple levels of meaning. And uh, a symbol in this context uh, could mean something. Yet in this context, it could mean something completely different. This is one of the one of the one of the things that I think I do have a one up with with doing this research is that I'm a lawyer and and when you're a lawyer one of the things they teach you in law school in fact it's one of the first things they do teach you is there's no such thing as black and white um, there's no such thing as good and evil there's only different shades of gray um, you have to look at the circumstances as to what the facts are um, you know not not everything is first degree murder not everything you know it could be but it may not be um and it's the same thing with the symbolism um a masonic icon or a logo in one movie could have supreme meaning in another movie it could have no meaning um and and and, and the way you the way that i i do it the way i do my analysis um is i have to look at the surrounding circumstances the context in which it's presented um, in some in some instances, it could have, like I said, in very important meaning. In other instances, it could have perhaps no meaning, um, and that always has to be borne in mind. And um, you know, w when I'm writing these books, one of the standards that I hold myself to is that I um, only present information or an analysis or a presentation that I'd be comfortable saying to a judge and jury. Um, you know that that's sort of the standard I hold myself. Yeah. So I don't I don't I don't go off the rails and say, oh, this is a square and compass. This means there's some sort of satanic Illuminati, you know, conspiracy trying to mind control everybody through television or anything like that. No, I take a deep breath and I look at it, and if I see that, I, I think that's going on. I will tell you, but often that is not the case. But you know, again, I, I have to look at the film and see what the context is and see what kind of movie it is. I mean, that could be also very important. Is it a Gnostic film? Is it alchemical? Um, are we dealing with a movie that involves uh, some sort of uh, initiation um, or, you know, something like that? So that, that's all, these are all things that get, you know, have to weigh into the analysis that um, I'm, when, when I'm writing the book that I'm presenting. Now, did you, I don't know if you could see the question on the screen um, from Derek. Um, the Masonic symbol itself is broken magic, which is negative. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, I would I would disagree with that. Um, the 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 I mean it, the Masonic square and compasses has been used since time immemorial um, to denote uh, you know it, it's it's working tools. Masonry uses working tools to teach a system of morality through um, the all-seeing eye is likely lifted from the works of Jakob Berm. Um, who uses that symbol all over the place? He was a 17th century Christian mystic. So no, I I would not um, I, I would not I would not view any. I've been involved with masonry for going on 25 years now. Um, you know, a lot a lot of the negative uh, stuff with masonry is left over from this guy in the 19th century named Leo Taxel, um, who created this myth that, Luc that Lucifer was the god of Freemasonry. It's a hope. It's been debunked. It was basically the 19th century version of QAnon. 
and um, it's total nonsense, but people still want to be naive and believe it. Derek, yeah, thanks for the question, by the way, too. You know, Derek, appreciate that. No, one, um, one show, it's on TV, and I was one of the things, like, really, especially with the occult, I wanted to give it. Have you watched Evil? No, I've never seen it, nor have I even heard of it, to be honest. Oh, with you. you have got to see this, especially this season, season two. They have one up to their game. I mean, it literally are mini movies each episode. It's fantastic. It's on Paramount Plus is the easy way to get. But yeah, if you get a chance, watch that one, because especially with the occult and everything, this show delves, obviously evil, you know, the name, but it delves. The, the premise of the show for anybody that hasn't seen it is you have you have this archdiocese that has, they have a team. They have a gentleman named David who wants to become a priest. They have this gentleman named Ben who is kind of the tech, the techie guy, the skeptic. And then you have Kristen, who is this, she's the psychologist one. And they go through, and every time they have, they go through like individual cases to see if it is in fact, you know, you know, what, what's behind these things is, is, are these miracles, are these things and different stuff that goes in there. But there's so much symbolism in this show. And that's why, especially for you, I think you'd love it. I mean, you'd, you'd see stuff all over the place. I'll have to, I'll have to check it out uh, my schedule is very busy, but thanks for the tip. And, uh, but yeah, yeah w w when, when, when I, when I, when I come on shows such as yours, I am inevitably asked, um, I mean, it happens routinely about a show or a movie that I've yet to see. And of course, um, I do not do any sort of interpretation or analysis or a review of something that I've never seen. So yeah, no, it's yeah. If you get a chance, like I said, yeah, of course. when you, when you have some free time, that, that would definitely be kind of up your alley, you know, for that stuff. That's, but yeah, basically, you know, when you get into this book, I mean, you break down a lot of ones. I mean, like we see in the cover, I mean, and we'll touch on that one too, is the Joaquin Phoenix's joke, you know, adaptation of the oh. Joker. Yeah. And you had a really good take on that, you know, how that kind of has the Wayne Gacy. Oh yeah. I mean, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very dark, uh, movie, um, to say the least. Um, and, you know, some of the stuff that is maybe a little not seen is the Joker's, well, in the Joaquin Phoenix one. I love the movie, by the way. I, th I think the mm -hmm. movie is fantastic. I, I tell a little interesting story about this, and I may have said it the last time I was here, and I'll keep it short, is the, book, the Cinema Symbolism 3 book was actually complete. And uh, it was in early January. It was right after the holidays. It was early January of 2020. Um, and I watched for the first time Joker and Midsommar. And I was so impressed with those two movies that I actually halted the publication of Cinema Symbolism 3 so I could go back and add them in. So that's how that's how impressed I was by those two movies. And Joker is no exception. Um, the, you're absolutely correct. The, the, the Joker um, makeup um, of Joaquin Phoenix is, is based upon John Wayne Gacy's Pogo the Clown or Patches the Clown. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, same face paint, different costumes, slightly different costumes. Um, and then, I mean, it, it's very dark. I mean, of course, Gacy was a child murderer and uh, murdered young men and buried them in the crawl space, of, crawl space of his basement. And then the other thing that was kind of, that was very dark in this that a lot of people didn't pick up on was um, when, when he, when, when the Joker, kind of comes out as the Joker. And this is the scene towards the end where he's dancing down the steps um, and he runs away and he eventually disappears into the subway and you have the two police officers going after him. The music that he's dancing to going down the steps um, is most commonly known as the Hay song. This is often played at sporting events. It's not anymore. Um, and this is done by Gary Glitter. And I believe the actual title of the song is called Rock and Roll Part Two. Um, and the reason why it's not played anymore is Gary Gary Glitter is a pedophile um, and is actually in jail for pedophilia. Um, so, wow. you have, so you have, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it shows you how dark this is. So you have the Joker yeah. wearing John Wayne Gacy's face paint and dancing to music by a pedophile. Pretty dark. Yeah. Some of these things, I mean, they're completely, you know, they seem when just on the surface when you're like, oh, it doesn't really seem, but when you actually start looking at these things, some of these things are so debt, you know, like peeling back the onion, you find these oh, things yeah. that you're like, Oh my God. You know, when you actually start saying, okay, this is this, this, you just start connection. You're like, this is actually pretty creepy. How it was something on the surface seems innocent, you know, in like a cool scene. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, that, that seems pretty disturbing. You know, the connections. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and it can be the slightest little tip off, um, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, these guys, some of them, I mean, they're really adroit ones. I mean, the guys who really are expertise 
are, are experts with this. I mean, the guys like the Hitchcocks and the David Lynches and mm -hmm. Darren Aronofsky and uh, Ari Aster. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just incredible, um, you know, what they what they will go through. I mean, and, and draw upon the, the, the one thing that the, the one thing that, that, that I kind of suggested in the last book, and I'm going to expand on this more is um, what these guys are using is I, I, I didn't I wasn't aware of this um, when I wrote the first two books. I kind of I, I, when I was writing the third one, this started to come into my perspective. Um, and now I, 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 I definitely I'm more convinced of it than ever is that it, it's they're using a form of what is known as the art of memory, which is this very arcane. Um, I don't want to bore anyone with this. I'm going to go over it briefly. It's this very arcane, um, ancient memory technique that was used originally for delivering speeches. It goes back to ancient Rome and ancient Greece, where if you were giving a long speech, this of course predates printing presses, um, you, 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 you would concentrate on a room as you were giving the speech and you would, in your mind, you would walk through the room and see images on the wall. And as, as you were walking through the room in your mind, these images would bring forth the speech you were delivering. Um, and this sounds arcane and kind of difficult, but believe it or not, it actually had been known to work. This was changed around in the Renaissance by a guy named Giordano Bruno, who got into, he, he talked more about the images on the wall than the oration. And basically he was talking about archetypes and, and how these images can be used to draw forth different things. And, you know, you know, it's all buried in your subconscious mind and we all share it. And I was, I, and, and it, it strikes me that this is more akin to what is going on with these movies, with some of the techniques these guys are using. They put things in movies and actors and to draw upon um, different things, it, to draw upon past movies and to try to, when you're watching this, it can be very subtle is to, is to um, draw you, draw in an earlier work and then sort of invest the movie that you're watching with the vibe or the, uh, vibration of this earlier work um and and the filmmakers that are good at this can do it quite effectively and um i mean it's it's quite astounding and and again you know these guys i mean i, tell, I, mean, I, I know you have questions but um oh, no no you're good no i mean like like for it like for instance um Ari Aster uses foreshadowing in a lot of his movies. Um, in fact, in the two that he wrote, he's an expert on it. He uses foreshadowing more than anything else. Um, and when you go up, when you watch Hereditary and the mother's up, and then you go up into the attic, you'll see a lot of headless mannequins up there. Mm -hmm. And um, not only does this have to do with him foreshadowing in the movie with the decapitations, but if you ever watch the movie The Exorcist, um, when Chris goes up into her attic, there's a decap, you know, there's a headless mannequin up there, and I'm constantly convinced that Aster is using that imagery from The Exorcist and transplanting it into his movie, which is very demonic. I mean, it deals with the same thing, demonic possession, um, to draw forth, to drink, sort of bring The Exorcist into Hereditary. Um, and, and Aster loves foreshadowing. I mean, he loves it. He uses it with expertise in both Midsommar and, and Hereditary. And again, I, I go back to The Exorcist, which has one of the best, if not the best example of foreshadowing in any movie I've ever seen. Um, and it's the scene where uh, Father Karras is listening to the voices um, of Linda Blair, Reagan McNeil in the voice studio. This is towards the end of it, and uh, or it's getting towards the end of the movie. Um, and he's listening, and this is the scene where the guy says, oh, that's English, it played backwards, it's English in reverse, let me play it. Well, if you watch the scene, you're going to see a, a, a Japanese word over the mirror, over the window, and the word is tsketi, um, and it's a Japanese word that literally means help me. Um, and the very next scene, of course, is where Father Karras goes into the bedroom with Linda Blair and help me comes up on her stomach. I mean, it's just a great example of foreshadowing, and uh -huh. I'm 100% convinced Astor's fascination with foreshadowing in film or anticipation of, of, of events in film is coming from that in The Exorcist because all his movies are demonic. Um, and of course, the granddaddy of the demonic film is, of course, The Exorcist. Oh, yeah. No. Well, that, that, that's crazy. That's a very good point you made there. The normal, the average person wouldn't, uh, we would have noticed the thing, the word on the mirror would have been like, oh, okay. Then the next scene would have said, help me across their stomach, but we would never equated that that's what that said on the mirror yeah it, it's above the window um it's above the window when in, in the exorcist when karis is with the voice uh guy doing the voice analysis um you'll see you, you go watch the movie you can put it in right now um right above the window you'll see this japanese word to 
um, which means help me. And again, this is anticipating the very next scene. And Aster, Ari Aster is so obsessed with um, foreshadowing that I am convinced that that's where he's getting that from. He's, a, he's obsessed with foreshadowing as much as Kubrick is with repetition in The Shining. It's uncanny. Well, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, thank you. Yeah, you know, I wrote three books about this stuff. Yeah, and that's and that's one of the things. Like, you know, you were as you were talking there. So one of the questions too I wanted to get get to you too is, um, you know, Gnosticism has really taken off in these last. Do you think this is Hollywood's thing of kind of just giving a nod, like, hey, this is going to be coming more into play, or do you think this is something where it just became in vogue and this yeah. was just kind of like you know, popular. So let's, let's just keep rolling with it. I'm glad you brought this up because this is this is a fascinating thing. And I don't know if this is reality reflecting art or art reflecting reality. Um, what's so interesting about Gnostic cinema and Gnostic Hollywood is um, you had this rash of Gnostic films being released. Let me just break down Gnosticism very briefly. I can get into it more if you want. It's a Christian heresy. The <laughs> word the word not gnosis literally means to know. Um, it's where you get the word diagnosis from. And it's a Christian heresy. It's very complex. It has some complex cosmologies, but um, some of the things, or you know, some of the um, things in the theology or the heresy, um, one of the one of them is like a false reality. You have different types of gods. Um, you have the demiurge, a creator of the of the material world, but then you have a god above him who's very spiritual. Um, you have the idea of spiritual and intellectual purification, coming to know thyself, which is one of the mantras of the mystery religions, of course, also part of the Scottish Rite years later. Um, what's so interesting about Gnostic cinema is you had this rash of these Gnostic films where you had the protagonist sort of com coming to know himself or even know herself. Um, at the at the end of the last at the end of the, at the turn of the millennium, I mean, all the Gnostic films we always wind up talking about are released in this time frame of about 1997 to 2001. Whether it be The Matrix or The Truman Show or Vanilla Sky or Donnie Darko or Thirteenth Floor um, or, or, or Fight Club, um, you 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 had this rash, and I don't know if it's intentional or if it was just an example of synchro mysticism or the collective unconscious at work. I don't know why this is, but you had this rash of Gnostic films being released at the turn of the millennium. And you, you, you could, you could craft the argument. I, I believe I suggested in one of my books that this had to do with, of course, the termination of the old age of Pisces, the start of the new age of Aquarius. Um, these movies are particularly unique. Um, in that they also incorporate a lot of uh, pre-9-11 imagery in them, um, which is very startling and very um, uncanny, to say mm -hmm. the least. Um, I do not believe that the filmmakers had a time machine or anything like that. I have suggested that this could be the work of, like I said, the collective unconscious at work, perhaps being uh, being predictive, be a predictive mechanism. This is a theory of mine. Um, I can't prove it. I can only suggest it. Um, but you do, you do have this this rash of this wave of Gnostic films being released at the turn of the millennium that all have this pre 9-11 imagery in them. Um, and whether this is synchronizing to the end of, you know, the procession of the equinoxes, the end of the age of Pisces, the start of Aquarius could be, um, could be the change over the millennium very possible. Um, but it is interesting. And it's something I talk about in the latest book. And I really don't have a, a whole explanation. I can, I can only provide um, theories. I can't pro provide a definitive explanation. I don't think anyone can. But no, it is just, interesting. It is interesting. And it's something that I have no problem talking about. Yeah, because they don't, they don't just outward say, you know, it's like, hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're why we're doing this. A lot of it is just, you know, subtle nods. I mean, I think there's some of it that it is definitely intentional. Because I know, oh, it, yeah, 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 but, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, some of the symbolism is intentional, but I don't know if this is. I mean, I don't know if all these studios got together and say, "Hey, let's release a wave of Gnostic movies." It doesn't seem like that. It doesn't feel like that. It seems like this was more of a, a collective, an unconscious mechanism firing this stuff. Um, that there was some sort of unconscious force behind the scenes doing this. It doesn't. It doesn't seem to be. I mean, I think the the imagery. I mean, I think that the movies are decidedly Gnostic. Now, whether they whether they knew this was Gnostic or not is debatable. Some yeah. are, some are not. I mean, for example, I mean, like Vanilla Sky with, with Tom Cruise is a great example. I mean, the, the filmmaker must have been 
been familiar with Gnostic tenets because the the female protagonist in that movie is named Sophia. I mean, who is of course a critical goddess in, in mm -hmm. Gnosticism. So, um, you know, I mean that that ha that was clearly obviously intentional. But when when you look at it and you step back and you look at this, these movies like Truman Show and Fight Club and Matrix, it it really to me seems more of unconscious, like some sort of unconscious force pulling the strings than it was some sort of direct hand saying, Hey, go make, you go make this Gnostic movie, you go make this one. And I think that even makes it more interesting um, that, that this, this seems to be coming from the realm of the supernatural almost. Yeah. And that, and that was one, you know, you, you know, the witch, you know, you had talked about the knocking and chant and the tarot imagery. And we had talked to her a little earlier about the ninth gate, the images in the books that were being, that you had to arrange a lot of those were some of those images were tarot, like the hanged man. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. the, 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 well, the well, the one thing with, that's cool. The, the the witch is interesting. I mean, it's a great movie. Um, yeah, if, if you ever if you ever watch it, and, and when she walks into the woods, there a lot of people aren't aware of this. You're hearing one of the Enochian chants. Now, to be fair about this, this is the Anton Lavey version of the. This is the satanic Enochian chants. Um, the original ones by John D. and Edward Kelly are um more neoplatonic lave got a hold of them and changed them changed them around and made them satanic um so for example when d says you know all praises to jesus christ or something like that lave twists this around to say you know all praises to beelzebub or whatever um so you know that has to be borne in mind um but yeah no the witch is a great movie there are very a lot of archetypal imagery in that Oh, and yeah, I mean, when, when you're dealing with the, you know, with the Ninth Gate images, yeah, I mean, you're dealing with tarot cards, you're dealing with the Lutheran mm -hmm. Bible, um, I mean, you're dealing with alchemical symbolism, um, absolutely, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, that stuff is the hanged man, I mean, you got, um, you know, the fool, I mean, clearly, the, you know, the, the, the idea of um, the, the traveler is the fool with the little knapsack, so yeah, I mean, you're, you're dealing with a lot of tarot imagery and a lot of archetypal imagery with the Ninth Gate, and same thing with the witch. You'll find this as well in that in that film as well. Great, great movie, by the way. Yeah, it was it was really there. Were, there's ones. I mean, like I'm really big fan of the Nun too. You know that one was that one was Karsh, but that's the same thing. There's a lot of you know there's a lot yeah, of well, subtlety in some of these. Well, when you watch when you watch the Conjurverse films, I have them all here. I mean, I guess you look for uh, in the in the Nun. It's like the Conjuring Two. Mm -hmm. um, you you look for Valak's name as many times as you can. Uh, it's, I believe, in The Nun, it appears three times, I want to say, on the chalkboard, or twice on the chalkboard, and then on the license plate when they get to Romania. It's all over the place in The Conjuring 2. Um, and, of course, you know, I mean, when you're dealing with these, James Wan, again, has has stated that he is a Kubrick fan, and, again, you're going to find a lot of homages to The Shining in those movies. Um, but, no, I am a huge fan of The Conjurverse movies. I like the, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, these, these movies, I like the three Annabelle movies. I like The Nun. Um, I like The Curse of La Llorona. I like the three movies. I, th I think two is my favorite one, probably. Conjury 2, I think, is my favorite. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, even, like, in the first Annabelle movie, I mean, you're going to see a lot of, References. I mean, you f I felt like I was watching a remake of The Omen and Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist. I mean, what, what, I mean, what, what is it in in uh, in, in the first Annabelle movie? The uh, characters are named John and Mia. I mean, that's a reference to the actors of in, in Rosemary's ba Baby, Mia Farrow and John Castavet. Um, I mean, it takes place in the apartment complex. Um, the woman, um, oh, I forget her name, the, the African-American actress who jumps out the window at the end with the doll. is I mean, that's obviously designed to evoke Father Karras going out the window in The Exorcist um, with the demon also. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean I, I'm a huge fan of the Controverse movies. I, I, I am actually contemplating taking them on in Cinema Symbolism 4. I probably will, actually, because I... I very impressed with those. I guess two is probably my favorite. I, I really liked in part two um, how they con how they like, how they conjured how they drew forth. I mean how they, that movie they really did a great job in setting that in the late seventies in Great Britain because that was just what that would look like. Um, and yep. uh, the the one thing I'll say I'll say about I'll leave it at this with the Conjuring two was um, when I watched it for the first time. And I, I guess a lot of people um, have this impression because I actually looked it up online. Um, the little girl in that who played Janet Hodgson. Um, is um, an American actress, which you could have tipped me over with a feather when I heard that because she, her British accent is more authentic than yeah. most British people. Um, I had no idea. 
Yeah, me neither. I mean, I'm looking at this. I'm like, oh, that's, you know, and when I'm looking this up, I'm like, oh, she's from New Orleans or something. I'm like, my God. I'm like, her British accent is more authentic than most British people. So, yeah, I was a huge, I'm a huge fan of the Conjuring movies, and I really liked part two. Yeah, Mark Eddy, you know, because we've talked about The Exorcist, you know, a few times. Mark Eddy brought up something, and I forgot all about it, that at, there at the end on the staircase where it says pigs. Yeah, I told him that. Yeah, this, and I said, and that was the thing. Is he he brought that up to me. He's like, yeah, you should talk about that. I was like, I had never even, I and that's why I wanted to bring it up here. Is like I had never even thought about that. And just the connections to that the, in the Bible with the legion. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have that. Um, I mean, I mean, there, there's a lot of subtleties in The Exorcist. I mean, there's a lot going on. I mean, you have the whole. I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Mm -hmm. There's one that escaped me that I just found out about. Um, well, like, for example, if you pay attention to it, you have the Father Karras figure, who is obviously the Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, the Christ figure. Um, he's the hypothesized Christ savior of the little girl. You know, as uh, what would it be Depeche Mode saying, your own personal Jesus, as it were. Mm -hmm. He's going to save the little girl. Well, if you pay attention to it, when you watch The Exorcist next time, um, Karras is by and large always ascending. He's always in a state of ascent. He's always going up a flight of steps. Um, in fact, when he's introduced, um, he's coming up onto the subway platform from 33rd Street. I mean, and that is an obvious Jesus reference. And it's actually um, not the first, it's, it's not the only 33 reference in the movie. There is one that is very well concealed. And it is so well concealed that I had missed it for years. In fact, I had just found out about it, to be honest with you. Um, you have Karis coming up on the... Um, up, up on the uh, subway platform from 33rd Street, when Chris is when when Chris is holding the party, um, and this is where Reagan comes down and go you know pees on the rug, um, they're sitting around a piano you know kind of inebriated the guests and they're singing a song, um, and and you can clearly hear this. Um, the woman sing, is, is singing this song and she says something to the effect of or sings something to the effect of um, down on the east side at toity toyed and toyed. I've heard this for a million years. I've heard this for 20 years, and I never bothered to look it up. And I'm finally sitting there one day. This was a couple months ago. I'm thinking, what in the hell is this woman singing? I mean, what is this? Um, and sure enough, I looked it up. I did a couple Google searches, and it finally it's, – it's a song. I can't remember who wrote it. It may have been like George Gershwin or something. It's a song from a play, a Broadway play. I can't remember what it is. But Toity Toyed and Toyed is 1920s New York slang for 33rd and 3rd Street. Um, and I never knew that before. Um, so that is actually the second 33rd uh, reference um, in The Exorcist. And again, the whole idea with this is that um, the Karras is the Christ-like savior, the apotheosized you know, hero figure. And of course he does. He rids the little girl of uh, the demon at the end. Um, so, you know, I mean, there, there is a ton going on in, in The Exorcist. Um, it's a great film. I mean, you know, the classic, uh, the, the greatest, I guess, horror film of all time. Yeah, and that three, 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 you know, lends to the Trinity. So, oh, I mean, cool. like I said, that's yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that like I said, you have several, you know, just they just, and that's the cool part, like especially about your books, one, two, and three. It's just this is something where you know we've watched movies, unlike the two below us, who um, I, I don't think they've even seen a movie theater in years. You know, if, if so it's when you watch these things and you actually have these books, you start going like, oh, my God. And then you go back and you watch the movie and you're like, there it is. It's right there. Well, right. Well, that's one of the reasons. Well, a couple of things on that. That's one of the reasons that I really like this study and like doing this is I've said this on other shows. I may have said this last time, but I can't remember is it's not like when you're doing this, or at least when I'm doing this, it's not like, you know, is it Bigfoot or is it a guy in a gorilla outfit or, you know, is it a UFO or is it Venus? You know, I could show you. I mean, it's there. You know, there's no ambiguous, you know, it's not ambiguous. You know, there, I mean, in Kubrick's The Shining, if you want to see repetition, I can count the ways with you. I mean, there it is. You'll see it with your own two eyes as surely as I can mm -hmm. see it. That's one of the reasons I like doing this study. Um, and the other thing I should just point out is I'm like the guys below. I haven't been to the movie theaters in years either. I was talking to um, one of my friends. I'm going to go back on his podcast, I think in December. He, he has convinced me to go watch. Um, the Matrix, the new Matrix movie when it comes out in December. And he said, go see I'll it in the theater and we'll, we'll do a show on it. And I said, that's fine. I'll do that. But I should point out that when I do these books, I mean, I have to have the movie here on Blu-ray or DVD. I mean, I cannot do an analysis or make notes in a darkened movie theater. I mean, I cannot tell you, 
you know, when, when, when I do this, I mean, I have to have that movie at the tip of my fingers where I can move forward, backwards, pause, go back, watch a scene a dozen times if I have to. Um, yep. you know, I, I mean, I can pick up stuff on a the movie theater, maybe get a general, general idea, but you know, I mean, I can't pause things and look at it and do this, that, and the other. Um, so, you know, the, I guess the point I'm trying to make is for me at any rate, when I do this, I mean, I have to have, you know, the Blu-ray or the DVD to do it, um, where, you know, I can, you know, really have the finger, you know, the movie at my fingertips. I, th I think you, that's like one of the marks of being a true cinephile too, is when you've had that on super slow-mo and you're going frame by frame so you can check oh, stuff out. Yeah. I mean, any, who, anybody that's watching it, you're like, here it comes right here. And if you look right back there, you can see the hidden Mickey in Star Wars. There it is. It's right there, you know, in the throne chamber room. You know, it's just, it, Absolutely. It's, it's the yep. same. Black Swan with Aronofsky is like that. I mean, he'll show you an image for a second. And it's like, wait a minute. Did I see that? And you got to pause it and look at it. And, <laughs> you know, yep. you know, you, you, you have to be able to move around and see stuff because, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're just sitting here watching it in a darkened theater, you know, even, you know, just for the first time, things will things will get by you. And then. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to butcher the name, Kaipo. You know, I think, don't, you know, thanks for turning in. You know, Derek, same thing. Thanks for everybody for tuning in as well. Um, yeah, that those, especially like the Matrix, um, I can't remember the last time you had you on if we talked about Constantine. Yeah, no, that's not a movie I, I've analyzed, and it's been years since I've seen it, so I'm going to take a rain check on that one. Yeah, that's that's why, too. It just Like I said, that's on the genre. It's just like those ones, if – if it's somewhere in there, uh, I'm. If it has something to do with exorcism, something like that, I've I've watched it. You know, that's that's one. I just I absolutely love those ones. And yeah, so if anybody hasn't seen The Exorcist, that's a good one to watch alone in, in the dark. You know, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so, about how many times you would say it take you to watch a movie to actually feel comfortable to do uh, an allergy on the what's in the movie? That's a great question. I I, I usually at least need three to five viewings of it. Um, but I will say this to you. There are some movies out there that are just so overloaded with stuff. I watch them. I mean, I've watched them. I've analyzed them. When I watch it again, I pick up on something new. Um, yep. So it's almost like a never ending um, study as it were. Uh, but, you know, you know, I mean, I mean, some are just so multi-layered with, 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 with levels of symbolism Um you know, it's, 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 I was on a show. I may have mentioned this here last time. I can't remember. It's like Midsommar. It's, I mean, that's a movie that just has so much going on in it. And, and I mean, I, I think in the book, I mean, I think it's like a 60 page portion of it. I mean, cause you got to analyze the movie, but then you got to go back. What makes that movie so complex is you, 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 you can analyze it and you know, you, you can pick up on stuff, but then there's a whole wizard of Oz undercurrent with it that you got to pick up on and then you got to go back and do the runes the elder and younger futhark um in in, in midsummer because because that has all awesome. and and that's that's very complex so yeah i mean i mean some movies are more overloaded than others and um yeah i mean but usually if, if i watch it three maybe and especially like i said once i have it on blu-ray or dvd um then i'm pretty good to go and i think that's one of the things too with, with some of the makers of some of the greats and the things that can do that because then not only is it just it's because i think a lot of times you get a movie you watch through it and you're like okay you know that's a cool movie but it's one of those like you said where you're like i gotta watch that again you know there's so much that happened i watched it again, and you watch this thing and it's amazing that even after you've watched it so many times you'll come across them like i don't remember that being in there <laughs> and you see it and that's what's really cool about the way that they do these things it's just yeah, as you start putting these pieces together and especially if they do more than one movie and a thing the a lot of times, like you said, they'll do a foreshadowing of something to come. And then you're like, ah, that was back. In, you know, and then I lo love that aspect when it comes to these movies. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, d definitely. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, you, you can watch a movie and, and still miss stuff. Um, and, and you know, you know, it's like almost never ending. And some movies, I, you know, I, I was on a show and, and I said something to the effect of, you know, like a movie like Black Swan. I said, I'm almost scared to watch it at this point. And I said, I'm not afraid of the movie. I said, but I know when I put that on, I'm going to wind up picking up on something else on it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a never ending study. So, um, no, I, I'm, I'm real happy with the books and um, I'm doing some edits on them right now. But I do believe there will be a cinema symbolism for probably not anytime soon because I need some movies to watch. I mean, I know um, 
I know, I, I know I'll probably do the Conjureverse movies. Um, the one I'm looking forward to seeing that comes out in a couple weeks is the uh, Cruella movie. Um, that looks very alchemical, just off the top of my head. Um, almost looks like a female Joker movie, um, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And then and then the new one, and I did this in Cinema Symbolism 3, and, and the sequel looks just as good, was they, they did the, uh, it came out in 18, was the Halloween movie, um, was the latest Halloween movie. And now they got the sequel to that coming out, Halloween Kills. Um, which I believe is due on probably, probably next month, I would assume, in October, although I heard it make it push back. But that one, um, yeah, I mean, I mean that, that one now they got Michael Myers' House on a Ley Line. So that should be interesting. And um, then you got this new Matrix movie coming out. So I imagine there will be a Cinema Symbolism 4, but there's going to have to be some more movies. Have to wait a little bit. Let, the, let some new movies come out for me to uh, analyze, as it were. And then um, Derek had a comment. And I'm going to let you answer this. I'm not going to answer for you. It's like, you know, is your, are your books, is there more of a purpose for entertainment or is it more on sharing like actual knowledge of the discoveries that are found? Oh, I, 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 I always try to write. Um, I mean, I always try to write from an educational standpoint, but of course, uh, you know, you, you, you know, I, I've said on other shows, I may have said it here. I mean, I think that one of the greatest sins that a movie can can be is be boring or dull, and I would say that with the book. I mean, you know, with a book also, you don't want your book to be boring. You want it to be, you know, somewhat controversial and to present mm -hmm. new information. And so I've always viewed my books as trying to be, you know, entertaining. I mean, I want people to, you know, enjoy reading them, but I've always viewed them as, you know, probably educational and maybe controversial and, you know, along those lines. I say. Mark, let's get into Elvis. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't have much to do with it. it too many sequins. Too many. Uh, I, I, I talk. I get. Yeah. It, the Elvis stuff you probably should read. Um, there's some very interesting parallels going on with his life related to the sun. Um, yeah. And and it's very it's very complex and it's a great example of again some sort of Jungian synchronicity at work. I, I have no explanation for it. Um, I can't imagine anyone does. But if you if you sit down and examine the life of Elvis Presley, it, it runs completely parallel with solar mythology, as it were. Um, it's an interesting study, and uh, I get into it in, in the first movie book, and I was so interested by it that I actually revisited it in uh, Cinema Symbolism Part 3. Yeah, and that's, you know, and that was... And I, I think um, one of the things, too, you know, it's like you get it, you kind of get into, you know, a lot of the solar alle um, allegories. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah. you know, you know, I mean, I mean, you get into I mean, you you know, you, you when you're getting into this, you're getting into the Christ archetype. I mean, you know, the the, the savior figure, the, the you know, Apollo, Jesus, the son, um, you know, the redeemer, uh, you know, I mean, of course, in in the you know, Christian mystery aspect of it. I mean, Jesus is the sun, the 12 apostles are the 12 houses of the Zodiac. Um, I mean, if you want to look at this from a more of a comparative pagan mythology, Jesus Christ is Apollo. God, the father is Jupiter or Zeus. Mm -hmm. Hermes, the divine messenger is John the Baptist. The virgin mother is Isis, the virgin mother of, or of, 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 of Horus, or even Minerva, who is also a virgin. Um, the, the, the Holy Spirit, the dove is of course Pegasus. I mean, so, you know, and then, you know, Jesus Christ personifies the sun, you know, the resurrected savior that brings light and life to the world, defeats the works of darkness or the nighttime sky, is born again every morning, um, yada, 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 never ending. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah. You know, I was going to say, I don't want to spoil it, but if for anybody that hasn't seen The Green Knight, you got to watch that movie. It's, it, it is one of those, because I think this, that, archetype you know the savior for, you know there's always like the hero you know the one that's always this one completely flips that around uh, what's the movie called the green knight I've, I've never heard of it yeah if it's it is fan it it feels like an indie film but it just came out in the theaters it's really really well shot i mean there's there's a few ones it feels like it takes a little while for the story to get there but there's so much to unpack as you're watching this because there's, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say much more. I don't want to spoil. I don't, I don't want to be the ones that spoils the movie, but yeah, the green Knight is definitely one of those where I, I think, I think you'd have fun unpacking that one too. 
I'll have to check it out. I've never seen it, so um, but I'll, I'll give it a, I'll give it a go. So we'll see. Yeah, it's, um, as we're doing, it's I can I can bring that up. But yeah, that's because that kind of leads into the question. I was like, do you think that's why when some of those movies that come out that kind of go against that one is that why they stick out so much? You know, like in memory, you know, where you have it, where it's just they they kind of do the opposite of that. They they glorify you know the negative side over over the you know where the the hero wins you know wins in the end it's always that jarring where the bad guys usually ends up coming out on top yeah I'm, i don't i don't think i understand the question no there's there's ones cuz you know the solar type you know you always have like zeus you know paul you have the one you know just the, the overarching but you always have that one where it's more focuses on the other side well, you say the one, f I, I need an example. No, I'm just saying like, yeah, I've, there's many movies. I, I could look up right now. Well, give there's, me one. Yeah, I'm trying to get one in my head right now. And it's, as we're going through here is, you know, if you guys have a question, I'll try to find that one so I can get, get that one because for him here. So what would you say um, your most favorite movie with all of everything depicted in it that is so easy for just a, not, uh, a beginner's eye to pick out? Oof. Oh boy. Um, I don't know. Um, I mean, it depends. I mean, it depends on how you define the word beginner's eye. Um, if, if you are familiar with the works of James, of jo excuse me, James, Joseph Campbell, um, you will see clearly see the monomyth in, oh, what do we have here? Yeah. I'm not, I don't know this one at all, man. So, yep. I'll have to take a rain check on that. And it but has it, the sun at the top, and that's why it has the crown. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd have to see it. I'd have to see the movie, though, to see the context it's presented in. Yeah. Um, but, but like, if you're familiar with the works of Joseph Campbell, um, you will clearly see the monomyth in the Star Wars movies. You will clearly see, um, you know, in the Harry Potter. You know, you can easily pick up on that. Um Boy, I mean, if you're familiar with Freemasonry, um, you know, if you're a Freemason, and you're a member of the high degrees, um, then the first national treasure is a ritual, is the Royal Arch of Enoch ritual, the discovery of the treasure vault beneath the uh, holy ground in the subterranean vault. Um, so, you know, boy, um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I, I would say, you know, I guess those, those would be the ones I would go with. So... Yeah, and I I can't find that movie I was thinking about here, so we're just gonna we're just gonna forget that one because we're not we're not gonna the, sit the, here. The, me the, oh, the solar hero figure is easy to define. Is it's Manichaean. It's light versus mm -hmm. dark. It's it's like Luke Skywalker, Harry Potter. It's the Christ figure who always is going up against some dark evil lord. If you have it where you have the villain is the good guy, like Hannibal Lecter, this is usually you know like you, this is like the dragon Mercurius, you know, or the anti hero. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 or like uh, Frank Booth. Um, this is usually this usually associates with this this character called Mercurius, um, and it's usually it has to do with alchemy. It, it's it's a it's a destroying figure. Um, it's it's sort of like Kali almost, like the wrecker of worlds. Um, that, that that that's sort of like the the antihero. Um, yeah, archetype. that's kind of what in a way that's kind of what I was getting at. You know, where it's just I think that's why Han Hannibal Lecter was such a memorable character because it was just. It was right. like completely flip the script, you know. It, 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 the the antihero is what you call the dragon Mercurius. Mm -hmm. This is this is the guy who is the wrecker of worlds, who has no motivation other than to turn everything upside down. Um, if you wish to see Mercurius rules uh, the constellation or the zodiac Gemini, um, and if you want to see this in film, watch uh, the Ninth Gate with the two brothers who are the twins who are you know turn everything upside down when they give up the uh, final engraving at the end. If you, if you ever watch The Ninth Gate, the two workmen at the end of the movie are the two brothers, are the Cezina brothers from the very beginning. A lot of people aren't aware of that. And they tip the mm -hmm. bookshelf down and the, the plate falls out. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's they're the destroyers. They're, they're the wrecker of worlds. They're the reason Boris Balkan failed. Um, this is Frank Booth in, in uh, Blue Velvet. I mean, it, his whole purpose is just to destroy Jeffrey Beaumont's Eisenhower like 1950s reality. Um, in 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 reality, it's Donald Trump uh, who was born on what June 14th, Gemini. I mean, it's Mercurius. It's just destroy everything. It's turn everything upside down. Um, it's what that archetype does, um, and it's a very popular one. 
Um, it's, it's a very popular, powerful archetype. Um, it's, it's a character that's present in all the phases of alchemy. I mean, and, and without Mercurius, you know, that's what that's the ingredient Quicksilver. It's what makes alchemy possible. Uh, transition, change. Um, so it, 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 it's, you know, you're dealing with a lot of alchemy, but it's psychological alchemy, as it were. And again, we're into the domain of Carl Jung, people like that. Um, where it, it's it's not only transmutation of base metal to gold, but it's a transmutation transmutation of a figure of a person as well. Wow, yeah, that's in you know we kind of touched on it a little bit too. Is do you think that the mainly you know Chris and Mason, you know your your thirty second degree? Uh, do you do you think that's because of the long held history of Freemasonry that, that that's one of the reasons why it's so prevalent in movies because a lot of people recognize the symbol symbolisms and it's easy to associate because, you know, grandfather, dad, you know, somebody was in it. So it seems a familiar thing. I don't know if it's prevalent in movies. I don't, it's not the word I would use to, to describe it. Um, I mean, I, I can only answer for myself. Um, I mean, I got involved with it because I come from a long line of Maryland Freemasons, going back to my great grandfathers, um, and a couple of my grandfathers. Now, it skipped over my father, but that's really the reason I joined it. I, I can only speak for myself. Um, I mean, it is interesting. People are drawn to it. I mean, uh, you know, you do have some Masonic themes are more overt than than mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, I mean, if you watch the man, you know, well, the Kipling novella the man who would be king well, kipling was a freemason and they made a movie out of it um with uh, michael kane and sean connery that's a very masonic movie um and i mean they're both freemasons in the film um and of course the national treasure movie and then being there with peter sellers peter sellers was a mason by the way um that has some masonic stuff i don't know if i would consider a villain called masonry prevalent um in, yeah, not so much like the main theme it's just one of those like if you if you break it down you see that imagery you know, in a lot of movies. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a cross. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it may not be necessarily Masonic though. Um, a lot of the, if not all of the founding um, fathers of the Hollywood movie studios were all Freemasons. Um, the lone exception being Walt Disney, who was uh, in something called Demole, which is sort of the Masonic Boy Scouts. That's really the easiest way for me to describe. Oh, he, he, he was a Demole. I never knew that. So he never made it to Freemasonry, but he was the under, as you take your son, it's from like 10 to like 15. Well, 18, 18, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. No, if 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 you are familiar with every conspiracy theorist out there wants to put Walt Disney as a Freemason, he was not one. He Walt Disney was not a Freemason, but he was involved in a group called Demole, uh, hmm. which is as Chris pointed out, which is sort of like the Masonic Boy Scouts. There is a famous drawing that Walt Disney did of Mickey Mouse wearing the Demole medallions and and regalia that he gave to Dad Land who was the founder of Demole. And it was an important part of Disney's life. I mean, I mean, he he drew comic strips with with Mickey and and Pluto and those characters meeting, you know, in the chapter of Demole in a lot of his comic strips. So it obviously had an impact on him, but Disney himself was not a Freemason. Um, I never but, knew that. Yeah, but a lot of a lot of the founders of the Hollywood studios, the Warner Brothers, um, Zanuck, uh, you know, D.W. Griffith, who did Intolerance and, uh, you know, Birth of a Nation. He was a Freemason. Um, so a lot a lot of the founders of Hollywood were Masons. So, again, it's one of the reasons probably why you have this interest in the arcane mysteries, as it were, um, permeating Hollywood. I had a question for you last time that was a little bit off the subject. I hate to veer off the subject, but... In yeah, there you go. Um, wow, yes. I never... I never seen that that's crazy yeah that's the drawing disney did for dad land who was the founder of demole so i wonder why he never pursued to be a mason because most demolays become masons when they reach the 18th adolescent the age of 18 to become a freemason yeah i have i have no answer for you um i i, I don't know why disney never pursued it outside of demole um but he didn't um but I, I can't offer you a reason why, other than he was in Demole. But that's 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 the alpha and omega of uh, Disney's mem uh, Masonic membership. Wow. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I had no I, I had no idea about that either until just now. That's that's cool. I'm trying to I'm trying to get Craig to um come on over, but I can't get him. I've been coaching him to come on over. 
No, oh, I, I, I've told him I go. My problem is my heart would not be in the right place. I'd be one. I, I always to, tell my, I go. I don't want to. I don't care about what's in the broom closet. I want to know what's in one of the old lodges down in the down in the room that only the certain few get to go into. Well, you you can find that there. Um, what you what what you'll get introduced to is a way of, of a way of thinking or seeing the world symbolically. That's what it did for me and. I don't think, or I don't think, I know that those, that when I say those, my books, the Royal Arch of Enoch, the movie books, even the fiction book would not exist, but for my Masonic membership, I can tell you that without question right now. Um, so, I mean, everybody enters it and comes away with something different. That's what it did for me. Um, but I, I would, you know, if, you know, it, it, you shouldn't really, it, you know, it's like you kind of said, I mean, if, um, if you want to join, I wanted to join. No one had to convince me uh, to join. And that's really the way it should be. Um, people do bring people in and sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't work out. But ultimately, the decision um, is up to the individual person. And like I said, for me, I can only speak for myself. It's something I wanted to do. And um, I'm very glad I did it. Well, Harris, we're, yeah, there's a rabbit. I, I didn't mention it in the beginning, and I apologize, um, too. Is, but for everybody that needs... For more information on Robert Sullivan, you go to Robert W. Sullivan IV.com. That's Robert W. Sullivan the fourth.com. And you can yeah, you can go through there and you can see that is he's got a link to link to the books, appearances, uh, you have profile, you can go here and you can get more all the information about him, everything his complete bio is right there. And then go over to Amazon right now and you, you just go click add all these to your cart right now. Just click all these and just hit <laughs> buy. No, just hit, that's that's the best way to do this. To just get them all, and then you know, you know, especially what we're talking about. Because right here, you got one cinema, one, cinema two, and then three that we're talk, talking about. These and the Royal Ark of Enoch that he, we were discussing before too. Uh, these ones, I mean, a lot of these are just showing Kindle editions, but I think all of these are available on paperback too. Correct. You can get them yeah. all in the print form. Um, the Kindle versions I priced out at six ninety nine. Kindle, uh, Amazon knocked fifty cents off of them. I believe they're six forty nine. Yep. Um, th there's a funny story with this. I'll just get into it briefly. Is, oh no, go for it. No, I mean it's no big deal. It, it, people, some people aren't aware of this. Actually, the, the more the more money you price your Kindle version at, because there's no expense, there's no expense with it. Um, if you actually price your Kindle book over ten dollars, you get less of a royalty than if you do if you price it under ten dollars. If you price it nine ninety nine or lower. Um, the, the, the difference in royalty between six ninety nine and nine ninety nine is about ten cents. So I figured, well, you know, for that little bit of money, I'll just drop it down to six ninety nine. But believe it or not, if you if you price your Kindle over nine ninety nine, if you put it at like twelve ninety nine or thirteen ninety nine, you actually get less money. Um, they actually punish you for doing that. Um, <laughs> so, so 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 you want to you want to you want to put if you if you're out there publishing or whatever, you're thinking about it, always put your Kindle copy under nine ninety nine. And I I put mine at six ninety nine because the difference is ten cents. Um, so you know you know I, I want to go lower than that, but um, you know you know that's that's why I price mine at six ninety nine. But if you put them over nine ninety nine, you actually get less money. So go figure. But I had a I had a question for you that was a little bit off subject matter. Um, as far as <laughs> since you you wrote many books on Freemasonry, um, do you do you know if by a fact if Prince Harry is a Freemason because I know he sticks his hand in his coat jacket. And that's depicted in the 14th degree, I want to say, when he comes out and he's looking over England, when he was looking over Wells, he would always have his hand in his suit jacket. That is one of the Masonic degrees. Uh, no, I know the, 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 the two princes right now, William and Harry, are not Freemasons. Um, if they were, this would be very well promoted. Um, but no, the, the, I, I do not believe that they are um, Freemasons. And you also have to bear in mind, um, high degree Freemasonry is very frowned upon in England. Um, you have degrees one, two, and three. The high degrees are taboo. That is no good in England. Yeah, it's also called the Royal Ark in England. Yeah, but 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 the high degree Freemasonry, Scottish right, York right, that's frowned upon. Um, oh. but, yeah, because it's who it associates with, of course. Um, but uh, you know, you know, in, in in England, it's you get the one, two, and three. You'll find some lodges to do the Mark Mason and the Royal Arch. But that's it. Um, and uh, any anything related to the Scottish Rite or the York Rite, that's frowned upon. It's not even recognized, I don't think, in England. 
It's good to know. Thank you. Of wow. course. Well, I, well, sir, once again, I appreciate it, man. That's just, I said, always like, uh, look for, I, I love talking movies. I l absolutely love it. So the, these have been a pl pleasure. Like I said, everybody, Robert W. Sullivan, IV.com for his site. Go once again, to Amazon, same thing. Robert W. Sullivan, the fourth brings up all the books right there. Like I said, just start going clicking like crazy. You know, well, under you 30 guys. bucks, you can have the collection. Thank you guys for having me on. It was my pleasure. And uh, when maybe Cinema Symbolism 4 comes out, if you ever want to do it again, just shoot me a link. Oh, uh, absolutely. So, yeah, I don't want to cannibalize your show, of course. But, you know, no. in, in six months, maybe after the new year or something, uh, we'll do it all again. Maybe we'll do some new movies like The Matrix, the Halloween movie. We can certainly maybe delve into that a little bit. And if you get a chance to watch The Green Knight, I'd love to see, I'd love to get your take yeah. on that. So Yeah, I'll check that yeah. out. Definitely. Yeah, that's one. Well, hey, Robert, thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. You're well, thank you, welcome. guys. Have a good night, Traveler. Thank you, brother. All right, everybody. So I said go to redbubble.com. You know, check out our merchandise shop there. You know, Three Beards Podcast is the name. That is, and if you notice up here, we need a sponsor. We have, we need a sponsor for up here. See, this is a blank square. There's a little blank spot up here on the corner there. We need a sponsor for the show. So if anybody's looking to just, you know, do, best way to do it, patreon.com, adopt a beard, or go to Redbubble and just pick up coasters, pick up a mug, do whatever. Just, hey, that's the best way to pr promote and, you know, support us, even stickers. We we appreciate that. You know, everybody, appreciate you watching. Thank you so much. Go, we are rebroadcast on Xeno Radio app, um, courtesy of Patriot Radio, every Thursday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. So go check that out and at jjbeardco.com. They are the ones that put us on there. So everybody, thank you for watching. Appreciate it. Like, subscribe, follow, do whatever on social media is. We appreciate that. Everybody have a great night. We will see you on the next one. Good night.